experience for us, but we are blessed to be a blessing. And sure, we can be ones who intentionally go out into the world and preach the gospel, bring the kingdom of heaven into the world, and we should. But there are those moments when God's just in the room. And so I just want to encourage all of us that just look for those moments, be aware of those moments, and allow God to just be present in the room. Very cool. Well, today we're going to the second book of Kings. Um, um, we're going to finish at the end of chapter 7, so there's a fair chunk of scripture that we're going to read through. Um, but this is a great historical narrative to read through. Um, this passage of scripture really speaks for itself, um, but I do want to draw some conclusions that will hopefully propel us further into God's purposes. So let me set the scene for you a little bit. It's during the time of Israel's split kingdoms. Um, where we have the kingdom of Israel to the north under the reign of King Jehoram. Um, your version might say Joram, King Joram, and the kingdom of Judah to the south. Um, the scene is set during the ministry of Elisha the prophet. Elijah has already ascended in the whirlwind, and this passage is nestled among the recorded miracles that Elisha performed. And as is common... Uh, and the scriptures with many of the relationships between the leaders and the prophets, um, Elisha is not very popular with the king. He isn't in the king's favor because of the rebukes that he brings for leading the people into worship, idolatry worship. So essentially the prophets were despised by the leaders, um, usually because they spoke truth. And that's something that should confront us and does confront us. When somebody speaks truth, it can be so confronting when we get that reality check and we don't want to hear it. Now, if we aren't able to humble ourselves and hear the voice of truth, we simply raise the stakes for a greater fall. Um, I'm currently watching my way through um, the Clone Wars series. I don't know if there's any Star Wars fans in here. Um, I haven't watched the series. It's quite good. It gives some of the background story anyway. But sometimes they have these uh, catchy proverbs at the start of each episode. Um, this one recently came up. Humility is the only defense against humiliation. It's kind of a play on words. Humility or humiliation. The Bible says it like this. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So I wonder, can we be humble and bring ourselves before truth? So this passage is set in a time when the people have fallen away from following God. Um, they've fallen away from truth. And sometimes when the world appears to be in a downward spiral, it seems like things are out of control and we can't make sense of the world that's around us. This is an opportunity to rise up. It's when we need, when we need it the most to bring truth, to bring hope and release the kingdom of heaven into the world around us. We are the light. We are the called. We bring light into the darkness. So here is Elisha. I think one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, recorded in the Bible, ministering during very difficult and extraordinary times. So the scene is set in Samaria, which is both a region and a city. Um, it's a place that's rich in the Jewish history. Um, it's located in the central highland region of ancient Israel between Galilee to the north and Judea to the south. Um, when the Israelites conquered the promised land, the region was allotted to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, they were the descendants of Joseph. Um, much later, the city of Samaria was built by King Omri, the father of King Ahab. Um, in Hebrew, Samaria is Shamron which simply means watch mountain or watchtower, uh, namely because of its elevated position. After the nation of Israel split, Samaria became the capital of the northern kingdom, the rebellious northern kingdom, and while Jerusalem became the capital of the south. Um, it was a strongly fortified city. It remained as the northern capital for about 150 years, enduring through multiple sieges until it was eventually captured by the Assyrians. Uh, in New Testament times, King Herod rebuilt Samaria, renamed it Sebast, which simply means venerable one, which was a well-known reference in honor of Caesar Augustus. 
Um, so this passage that we're going to look at today is focused around King Jehoram of the northern kingdom who was part of a long line of evil kings. Um, not to be mistaken with the son of King Jehoshaphat, also named Jehoram, a king from the southern kingdom of Judah who also has the same name and also reigned at the same time. So King Jehoram of the northern kingdom is the son of King Ahab and Jezebel. He is the brother of Ahaziah, who followed in the footsteps of his mother and father by serving the Baals. And Ahaziah ruled for a short time, just two short years before falling out of a window and eventually dying. Uh, we learn in chapter 3 that Jehoram became king over Israel at Samaria during the 18th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign over the king of Judah. Um, and he reigned as king for a total of 12 years. The Bible says he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his mother and father, because he got rid of the sacred Baals that his father, King Ahab, had made. But he continued to lead the kingdom and to worship false gods. Um, he is also the half-brother of the wicked queen, Atalia, who was married to King Jehoram of the southern region, um, Atalia being the only recorded female monarch within Israel and Judah's history. After her son's brief rule as the king of Judah, she kills the remaining dynasty and reigns for six years before she is finally overthrown. And her grandson, Jehoash, or Joash, your version might say, who was hidden as a baby in the temple, is made king at the age of seven. So during the time that this narrative is recorded, Israel and Aram were almost continually at war. Aram was the ancient name for what we today call Syria. So relations between Israel and Syria had never been good. King Ahab eventually died at the hands of the Syrians while trying to recapture uh, Ramoth, one of his cities. Um, so we land at two kings chapter 6, and we find that Syria is sending raiding parties into Israel with very little success because Elisha is advising the king prophetically to be aware of certain areas where there are certain threats. So now the frustrated king is starting to believe that there is treason in his own ranks. So he gathers together his leaders, um, some of his servants, and he learns about what Elisha the prophet is doing. It says this, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Um, we know that the Syrian king is already familiar with Elisha and his ministry because in the previous chapters, Naaman the Syrian, the Syrian general was healed um, by this very same man of God. Um, so now the Syrian king comes up with this plan and he sends an army to go and capture the prophet, essentially to cut off the voice of God. Now, a tactic of war is to break off communication. God was giving vision and insight to the king through Elisha. If he could take out Elisha, then his strategies wouldn't be revealed and his raiding parties would have success. But if he really thought about it, if God was already talking to Elisha about his current movements, he's really trying to outsmart God. I think the point is he wasn't aware of God. He was aware of the man in the flesh. He was aware of the miracles, but he didn't know God. So the Syrian army is sent to where Elijah is and surrounds the city of Dothan. And when the servant of Elisha gets up in the morning, goes outside, he sees this army surrounding the city. And all he could sense was doom. Uh, verse 15, he says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Um, again, we see... He wasn't aware of God, only the man of God, only Elisha, who could have performed the miracles. So Elisha prays, open his eyes, and now the servant can see what Elisha sees, the army of the Lord surrounding Elisha. This is a lesson for us too. You know, when we find ourselves completely surrounded, it looks like everything's fallen apart, nothing is working, it's just so overwhelming. Even the insignificant small things seem to be snowballing. And all we can sense are feelings of anxiety, feelings of fear, unable to see beyond that which is surrounding us and standing before us. You know, we easily get fixated on the things that we can see before us. You know, we live in a world that is so sensual, sensual to the flesh, 
to touch, to smell, to hear, to taste. These senses in themselves are not evil. We were created to feel things, to taste things, to experience things. But we are born again of the Spirit. And there is a spiritual awareness and discernment that is available to those who have been baptized in the Spirit because the Spirit comes and lives within, who promises to lead us and guide us into all truth. Now, the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We are heirs of the promise, temples of the Holy Spirit. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. If my God is for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, for no weapon formed against me shall prosper. So now in response to the army that's surrounding him, Elisha prays again, and the entire army is struck with blindness. Now what's interesting here is the word used for blindness, and we see what happens in the next verse after they've been struck with blindness. They're not just walking around as if they've got their eyes closed. It says this, verse 19, Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So here was Elisha. He was the man they had come looking for, speaking to them after they'd been struck with blindness. These men knew where Dothan was. They knew where Samaria was, but they still followed Elisha to Samaria. It's more like they were struck with a stupor or a confusion. Um, There's two other examples where the same word is used. Firstly, it's found in Genesis 19, where we find in the city of Sodom, where the men of the town have surrounded Lot's house, and they're trying to break down the door to get to the angels, and the angels strike the men with the same kind of blindness, which causes them to become weary whilst they're trying to find the door. Again, it's used in 2 Kings 2.18, where Elijah has just been taken up in the whirlwind, and the mantle has been picked up by Elisha, and the sons of the prophets, they begin to pressure Elisha to let them send 50 men to find the body of Elisha of Elijah, which Elisha knew would be pointless because he saw the body ascending into heaven. But they kept urging him, and because of their blindness, their unwillingness to see, he followed them, he allowed them to go and search. The word means to cover with a skin or to put a film over. You know, I think that's a key point of prayer, to open our spiritual eyes, to make us spiritually aware so we don't focus on the problems, We don't focus on the people that we see before us. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but the Spirit would allow us to discern what is really happening. Now, are we going to be like the the sons of the prophets where we're actually looking for something that isn't there? Are we blaming an enemy who wasn't even present, giving him credit for something that he hasn't even had a hand in? Maybe it's like Paul where the scales fell from his eyes. I wonder, can we humble ourselves before God to open our eyes and let him reveal what's really going on in our hearts because it's less about what's happening externally and more about what's happening inside. If my people will humble themselves. So Elisha leads this army into the northern kingdom's capital, Samaria. Their sight is restored And there's this opportunity where if they wanted to, they could take the lives of this entire army. But instead, Elisha advises the king to feed them and send them back to their master. And it's almost like a fairy tale ending. The king prepares a great feast. They eat, they drink, and they return to the master. And scripture says that the bands of Syrian raiders came no more in the land of Israel. It's amazing what kindness and generosity will do rather than the use of a sword. King Jehoram thought to use a sword to slay the enemy, but the man of God uses kindness and generosity. So this was an extraordinary time. The kingdom of Israel was divided. It had been under constant attacks and raids, or at least the threat of attack was constantly present. There was idolatry. There was treason. There was corruption within the divided kingdoms. Uh, There were those who were vying for positions of power and influence who were simply interested in promoting their own kingdom rather than the kingdom of God. These were some dark times. Yet, in the midst of it all, in the midst of the corruption and the struggle for power, 
there were still those few who were faithful to the call of God, the light bearers of truth, the salt of the earth, the leaven for the bread, who were bringing the influence of God's kingdom into the world around them, which looked to be spiraling out of control. And we'll see as we continue on, there's just these four men who are outcasts. They were underdogs who weren't even allowed inside the walls of the city. Four men who no one really paid much attention to, who become the heroes in the story. So the raids have stopped, but not the war. And in the very next verse, now the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, has gathered up his entire army, not for a raid where a contingent would come. They'd basically raid the livelihood of the people. They'd take their crops, their livestock. Sometimes they'd take away prisoners who would become slave, slaves. But this was, was no raid. It was a siege. And not for the first time that Samaria had been besieged. Uh, we see that only recently in 1 Kings that Ben-Hadad I had unsuccessfully laid siege on Samaria when Ahab was king. You know, in ancient times, a city wasn't a city unless it had gates and walls, where the walls served as protection against invaders and the gates were a means of controlling those who came in and went out. You know, besiege has the meaning to confine, to shut in, to enclose. And in times of war, an enemy would lay siege on a city, and the purpose of the siege was to starve the inhabitants of the city starve them of food and water, cutting off all trades and communication with the outside world, forcing the inhabitants into isolation. They would blockade any support or reinforcements that were being offered from the outside, forcing them to eventually surrender before an infantry was sent in to take over the city. A siege could take months, even years, but it was an effective means of taking a city. Once isolated, it just takes time. Now, when a city is under siege, restrictions are put in place and the normal day-to-day activities are put on hold, which affects everyone and everything. Basically, businesses close down, except for essential services. Social activities and gatherings are put on hold and the city goes into lockdown and everyone stocks up on toilet paper. (laughs) Not true. And so the city is under siege and the situation is desperate. And because of the siege, there is famine in Samaria. And we can tell just how desperate it is by looking at what's on the menu. Now, I've had my share of some different food and not just because I was desperate. Um, I've eaten pig's heads, which are delicious. I've eaten fish heads, which are also delicious. Tasted the eyeballs. But who would want to eat the head of an ass? Now, I'm sure the author was laughing when he wrote this. So a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's about two pounds, just under a kilo. I checked the price of silver, and it's selling for 1,200 New Zealand dollars per kilo. Also on offer was dove droppings, and it was selling for about $120 New Zealand per litre. So some translators um, believe that dove droppings were used for for fuel. Um, The NIV version translates it as seed pods, and here's why. There's a plant that is still around today, but back at that time, um, it was known as dove's droppings, and it was essentially a plant uh, with an edible bulb. Today it's known as the Star of David, which still grows. Um, It has this edible bulb, and it's probably what is being referred to here, seen as they're talking about food. But that's not all that's on the menu. We also read later on that the city is down to a small number of horses. And this is where it really gets dark. We're going to pick it up at verse 26. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help my lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? He gives her a flippant answer. He's brooding, he's angry at God. Verse 28, then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. 
These were dark times. This was a time of famine. You know, right before he sowed, he tore his clothes, and the people saw that he was wearing sackcloth, which was basically made from goat's hair. It was uncomfortable to wear. I don't know if you've had, like, some scratchy wool next to your skin. It was just like that, very rough. And it was a way of showing sorrow. It was a way of showing repentance. But what's really interesting about what's happening to them right now was written about by Moses when he warned the people if they abandoned following the Lord. If the king had opened the scriptures, he would have known exactly what was happening. We're going to take a look. It's in Deuteronomy 28.53. And it says this, You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you, and the siege in des- desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you already foreseen by Moses. But instead of repenting and being humble before God because he wasn't really repenting, I think he was just really feeling sorry for himself, much like his father Ahab over Naboth's vineyard. Let's read what happens next, verse 31. Then he said, God, do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. So he reacts with rage and he directs his anger at Elisha. And he assumes that this is the work of God coming against them. Verse 32, But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him, and the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how the son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. It's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. Basically, he's just saying, hold the door closed, wait for the king because he's right behind him. Verse 33, and while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then the king said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? I think we can identify with this. Now, The king's at the end of himself. He's desperate. He's at the point of blaming God. Why waste another moment waiting for God when there's no hope? Come on, I've been there. You've been there. Now, Elisha, instead of bringing a rebuke to the king, he delivers some news, some good news, some great news. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. In other words, the famine's going to be over and food will once again be plentiful and not, it will be at the normal prices. The very next day, grain and flour will be sold at completely normal prices. Verse two, so an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, Elisha, that is. In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. That's the voice of doubt and unbelief. And again, we can all identify with that. You know, we don't know how long the city has been under siege. We do know that things were desperate. The people were starving, resorting to cannibalism. They probably see the people walking around like skin and bones. And what happens to us? eventually we can lose faith, we can give up hope, and our own voice starts to sound like this captain, the voice of doubt and unbelief. God, can't you see my situation? Why aren't you helping? Why don't you do something about it? Why does this keep happening to me almost like a torment? Come on, we get this. Notice what Elijah says, Elisha. You shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. That's what happens when doubt and unbelief take over, we see the blessing of God, but we don't experience it. We see the blessing around us, but we don't experience it because of doubt and unbelief. So now it's time to meet these heroes, verse three and four. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. They said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we will die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. Hmm. Now, it doesn't get much worse than being a leper in ancient times. Lepers were complete outcasts from society. Uh, They were feared. They were loathed because of 
the perceived threat of being contagious. Um, Leprosy was considered by many to be a curse, and for that reason, lepers were generally untrusted and not to be taken at their word. Um, They weren't allowed among the general populace, um, and they were called unclean, sometimes wearing a bell. And wherever they went, they would have to cover their mouth when they came upon somebody, and they would have to give a warning. Unclean! 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 So that the clean person could avoid touching them because anyone who touched the lepers would become unclean and would have to go through a purification ritual until they were announced clean by one of the priests. So these four lepers realised that there's no point going into the city because they knew there was no food there. If they stayed where they were, they were going to die from starvation. But if they were to go over to the enemy's camp, they might live. And if not, they're going to die anyway. So the lepers, these outcasts, decide to take a risk and step out in faith. Verse 5, And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. So you've got to wonder how big this panic was. It was big enough that they didn't even bother to grab their horses or to grab anything. They didn't even see an army. All they heard was the sound of an army coming. It was a perceived army. And God caused them to hear something that wasn't actually there. No one inside the city heard this thing, not even the lepers. And who knows, maybe this was the same army of the Lord that was revealed to Elisha's servant in the previous chapter. Verse 8. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. This was the last thing they expected to find. The lepers who were the biggest outcasts turned out to be the heroes. (coughs) Initially, they were impulsive. They were caught up in a frenzy, eating, drinking, helping themselves to silver and gold. But they soon come to their senses, even in the midst of experiencing daily what it was to be outcasts of society. Amidst the challenges of what had become their normal lives, taking on all the risk and going over to the Syrian camp. They didn't owe anything to anyone, but they never lost their sense of identity and loyalty to their king and their fellow countrymen. So they went, called to the gatekeepers of the city, verse 10, and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp and surprisingly no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out and they told it to the king's household inside. So the king arose in the night and said to the servants, Let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they came out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. Doubt and unbelief. So there's a couple of things to note here. Now, lepers were regarded as being under a curse from God. They were generally untrusted. Um, But King Jehoram wasn't a godly believing man. He was full of doubt and unbelief. He was paranoid. And he immediately assumes the worst, that this was some sort of trick by the Syrians, even in light of Elisha's prophecy earlier in that day. But there was at least one servant who offered some good advice, who still had a slither of hope and also realized that there was nothing left to lose. Verse 13. And one of his servants answered and said, Please let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed, I say, they may become like all the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. So they're either going to die from going out to see if the Syrians have left, or they're going to die 
by being eaten. Therefore they took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan, and indeed all the road was full of garments and weapons, which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Not only did they flee without their horses, but they were so panicked that they removed all of their armor, they cast it away, all their weapons, so that they could get away faster. Verse 16, then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a seer of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Israel was saved. The prophet's word came to pass, and they didn't have to do a thing. The battle belonged to God. And just in closing, I want to invite Patricia, we're going to come back, come back and start, start playing the keys, please. And this morning, I wonder, in light of these passengers, in light of the many characters that are involved in this narrative, I wonder if we can lean in and associate with them. Maybe in our own humanity, we can associate with all of them, like Elisha, the minister to the people, connected to God, faithful, powerful, being the voice of truth and reason. Maybe like the people of the city who were starving, you know, there's a desperate need for the people in our world to hear the good news and receive spiritual nourishment. You know, the armies of Ben-Hadad represent an enemy who opposes spiritual truth and he wants to cut off supply. There is an enemy who wants to quench the power of the gospel, who wants to keep people enslaved and chained. King Jehoram and his right-hand official represent doubt and unbelief, seeing the blessing but never experiencing it. The lepers, the ones who stepped out of faith, the heroes, the ones who risked it all, and like them, we found true riches and salvation, but we are blessed to be a blessing, to release the kingdom of heaven to the world around us. We are light in the darkness. We are salt in the earth. We are the leaven and the bread. I want to invite you to stand. <clears throat> so how do we respond to truth? Father, we're asking this morning that you would reveal your truth to us. Father, I just pray for every person in this room that no matter, no matter what we may be walking through, no matter what the enemy may be presenting before us. I want to thank you that your word is truth. I want to thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son, you sent your Holy Spirit to indwell us, the hope of glory, Christ in me. Your word says that you'll lead us and guide us into all truth. So, Father, for, for every person who would be just thinking on a situation this morning in their world, Father, you are the, the God who conquers all. Father, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Lord, I pray that in the midst of that, that there would be hope. Father God, I want to thank you that you've called us to be a blessing to the world around us. Blessed to be a blessing. And I pray that, Father, we would see the opportunities. Father, you would open up our eyes to be spiritually aware. Father, of your presence. Father, of the spiritual condition of the people around us, and when those opportunities arise, Father, your presence would just fill the room. Father, just be a natural sharing of what you've done in our lives, Father. Uh, not out of some sense of obligation to, to, to preach the gospel, but Father, out of a sense of bringing food and nourishment into the world around us. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be your hands and feet, to go into the world. Father, to lay hands on the sick, to see them recover. Father, through you, all authority has been given, which has been released to us, Father, that we can go and make disciples of the nations. And so, Father, this morning, I'd ask that you renew that in our hearts this morning. Father, that we are ones who are called to go, to go, to go into the world around us. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to pick up a song in a minute, and we're just going to open up the altar. If you'd like prayer this morning, you know, maybe I've touched on something that's, that's, that you've connected with this morning. Uh, maybe there's something happening in your world. Maybe there's someone in your world that you're praying for. We would love to just partner with you in prayer. There's so much power in praying together, ministering together, and we'd love to be a part of that. So as we pick up the song, um, the altar's open. The prayer team is here.
Thank you, Jesus.